Alrighty, so are you guys ready for a mega review? Because I'm about to do so where I'm going to look at all 13 games that happened in match week number 29. And there was definitely some interesting game that happened. Some MLS After Dark kind of game that we, we saw from this week. But also, I think this week we started to kind of have an idea of who potentially looked like they're done for the playoffs. And who is still hanging on to dear life in terms of the playoff hunt. Because the standing wise... There is started to be a little bit of a gap that has been shown in both conferences, especially in the playoff race. But that being said, let us actually begin this mega review. And I'm going to try to keep this under two hours. And we start off with the first game between Minnesota United versus FC Dallas. And you know, how can I say about this game? This might be crazy to say, but I don't think the scoreline really indicated the fact that the Loons play absolutely terrible. In this one in fact i would say that this believe it or not is not one of the worst performance i've seen minnesota united play this season i've seen them play worse than this but the problem is that three minutes where dallas basically blitzed this team and scored three goals was pretty much the undoing of this team and this also is a big red flag uh in this one and also the game against rsl that yeah this defense is probably going going to be the reason why this team is not going to go deep into the playoffs. Now, in the first half, uh, Fiera would hit one straight to Dane Sinclair, as I thought it was a good start for FC Dallas, but less so for the Loons, as they had a rare kind of slow start. This is a team that always tends to start well uh, this season at Allianz Field, but that doesn't seem like was the case, because I thought Dallas were the better team coming into this game, and not to mention the fact that they are the fresher team, because they didn't play in the middle of the week. Uh, though Paz did deny Reynoso in the front post before Reynoso blasted wide after just a terrible turnover for, from Dallas. And that, yeah, Dallas really got away with one there because, you know, with the form that Reynoso has been in, you expect he buried that one into the back and that. Though Ariola did flash one wide from close range. I thought both teams was getting some good early chances to score the opening goal. Uh, Fiera had a chance in the 34th minute, but he missed just wide as he went through on goal. And defense, I thought, once again, was a liability for the Loons. I mean, I talk about about in the last game against RSL of how bad this defense is. And this is going to be continue to be, be a, a theme for this team. And that, again, knowing the fact that this team looks like they're not going to make some defensive reinforcement, I am very concerned about this team in terms of the likelihood of going deep into playoffs. Because this defense that we've seen in these last two games, I won't be surprised it could be a first-round exit or even... Uh, there could be a case where they could have a late late collapse because, you know, after this game, I'll, I'll talk about how the Loons, you know, their playoff hold it looked like heading into this week after the win against Houston was pretty much at like 95%. Yeah, it seems like it had drop, dropped down because of some of the res resort has kind of gone against them. Though, uh, that being said, we do head to halftime scoreless between both of these teams, but we wouldn't be scoreless very long heading into the second half, and this is when the implosion happened. Uh, in the 55th minute, uh, Boxo unfortunately scored an own goal to give Dallas a 1-0 lead. It was a beautiful ball delivered into the box. I think it was was legit the one that delivered that one in. It might have been Ariola, but either way, Boxo trying to to uh, pretty much block that and trying to stab it out for a corner. But unfortunately, he's that one into his own net. And yeah, uh, Dallas got a 1-0 lead. And before I even had a, a chance to kind of pro process the fact that, oh, it looks like they're going to have to come from behind again, Dallas score a second goal. It's Velasco scoring from Legit and Pomico to make it 2 nothing in favor of Dallas. It's a great goal from Alan Velasco, I would say. But, yeah, the closing down was not good enough from this Loons team. And to make matters first, it would be 3 nothing in favor of Dallas in the 58th minute as Jesus Ferro would score from Legit. To make it 3 no nothing in favor of the Visitor, it was just a complete impulsion by this Loon's backline. Like this, you know, all the field not only was, was shell-shocked, but I think that entire backline was shell-shocked. Like, they literally stopped playing for three, three minutes there, and it's, and yeah, it turns out that, of course, would be the, the difference. In fact, uh, it looked like it could have been 4 nothing when Jesus Ferreira just puts it wide from close range. Like, Jesus Ferreira, he could have had at least a hat-trick in this one. He had a lot of chances in this game. And to make matters worse, uh, the Loons were actually down to 10 men when Fragapani got a second yellow card in, in this game. And yeah, I mean, it just feels like it's a, to add salt to, to what has been a nightmare mare game for the Loons in, that, in the deep wounds that, that they had up to that point. Though, what's kind of interesting is that that red card kind of helped 
this team. And in some way, you know, we talk about the narrative of just because you went down to 10 men, it doesn't mean mean you are going to be blown away most of the time. Because I thought Minnesota did start to play much better and they kind of recover up. Uh, uh, recovered to try to get one back. Uh, Paz denied Benitez from long range before Lud had a chance from from uh, close. And in fact, had a free header, but he hits, hits that one wide, which kind of just sums up the Loons finishing. It was just not there in this game. And again, they finally woke up, but why do it when it when it's free? Nothing down. Like, this, this game was probably over. They were pretty much just playing for pride. Though, again, I think that's a combination of Dallas pretty much just kind of took the foot off the gas. Like, they were pretty much shutting up shop, looking to hold on to this 3 nothing lead, which they did exactly that. As in the end, Dallas with a massive 3 nothing win to get back to third place in the Western Conference. And the shots in this one, 15 shots with a 10 that Dallas had. Two shots on goal for the 3 that Dallas had. Three shots off target for the 9 that Minnesota has. Both teams had four shots that was blocked in possession-wise. 58% possession compared to the 42% possession that Minnesota has in this game. And like I said, as crazy as this sounds, it wasn't really the really as bad as maybe some people have said that it was an embarrassing performance. Sure, yes, you know, coming into this game, knowing how after they threw away that game against RSO, you know that anything but a win is going to be a huge dis disappointment. And not only that, but again, the defense just completely collapsed in, in that in those three minutes and that as i said this defense i mean i i, I just i'm really concerned about this defense and and the, the the thing that makes me even more worry is that there's really nothing that can can change them make it better because they didn't add any reinforcement in that back line and that i feel like that's something that they got to have to do in in the off season because that back line as i mentioned it is aging a bit even without Debasi being there, you know, you got Michael Boxo approaching his, his uh, mid-30s. And in this game, yeah, it seems like father time has caught up to him because he probably had the worst performance he have had, had this season. And that some of the goals that the, that, that the Loons can see was really because of Boxo not, not doing a good enough job there on the defensive end. And yeah, I mean, this is a team team that, you know, unless if, if somehow they can, can fix this defense problem that they, they had... I don't think this team is going to go deep. And that's even when they do do have, have some good attacking talent. And again, they could have easily had a goal in this one if their finishing was better. But I, I don't think the finishing is the, the least of this team problem. This team just simply cannot de defense right now. And that when they do face against better team. Heck, even down, down the stretch, I talked about how they do have a very tricky schedule down the stretch. Have to play against Portland and LAFC next. I, I can't see how this team is going to get get points against two teams that are very lethal going for it on the attacking end. But that being said, uh, moving on in terms of the next match is Columbus versus the Chicago Fire. And this game pretty much sums up the crew in terms of their home form at time this season, which is no matter how when they had time, they look like, like they're the dominant team. They somehow weren't able to get all three points and it ends in a nil-nil draw. Now, to be fair to the crew, this was Gaga slowing the game. Like he decided that he is going to show people why that the hype that that a lot of people had had about Gaga slowing being the future of the U.S. men's national team back in May was a real thing. And even though I know he kind of struggled during June and maybe that hype kind of got in his head a little, but boy has he bounced back big time because he was an absolute wall in this game. Like he was not allowing anything pa pass his his own net in in this one and in many ways. He's kind of the reason why this game ended scoreless because Columbus absolutely peppered that, that Chicago net and yet Slovenia just stood on his head and, and keep a clean sheet. Now, early on, I thought there was a lot of possession early for the host, but they can't quite quite find a way to bypass the fire low block. Uh, that's kind of another thing I want to say about the fire this season and that even though I know it's been a disappointing season for them, one thing that has been a very positive is their defense. I mean, this is one of the best defensive team in the league. And I think the only reason why this team isn't really considered to be a playoff contender is just the attacking end, where they, they have, have struggled. Uh, Herbert then blasted high from long range as the first shot on goal for the crew came in the 25th minute after Cucho puts it straight to Slonina. Then Slonina denied Zarion from close range before he denied Etienne from close range in the first minute. Get used to me talk about Slonina denying shots because he would have, have, have more of that heading into the second half. As we had to have time scoreless. Now, in the second half, uh, Sands blast one into the stands. And like the first half, I thought Columbus kind of dominate possession. But it feels like like some of the chances that they create, at least early in the second half, 
still are just kind of half chances and they still had trouble in terms of breaking down the fire resistant on the defensive end and also most importantly solving Slowina. i mean they had no answer in terms of how to get 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 Slowina uh to to finally let let one in uh kucho then blasts one into the stands before he flashed one wide as columbus you know they were getting closer for the opening goal but again you know the those the the finishing w was not there and that kucho hernandez i thought in this game it was definitely one of one of his poorest game for the crew where he has a lot of opportunity and we know he's a lethal finisher but he just could not could not find that lethal finisher that he used to have during his early days with the crew. Uh, he then heads it wide from close range in the 59th minute before Slonina would deny Zarion from long range. And again, the pressure was mounting for the crew that they were pressing for the opener. But up to that point, they still have not saw Slonina. And they would not solve Slonina in the 62nd minute because he would deny Kucho from close range. And this is where I, I wrote Slonina is a brick wall right now because he is refused to be beat in in this one he is not letting any, anyone in and i also might have said that this might be one of those games again for the crew where we've seen this before this season at home they have a lot of chances but they're not being clinical in terms of their finishing and being wasteful in front of goal and aren't able to get that crucial three points uh though mensa tried to change that but he heads it right to sloan in him uh before Mueller had a rare opportunity for the fire but he hits that one straight to Ilar rome and as the time winds down, Columbus, again, continued to throw man forward. They were looking for that equalizer, or not looking for the equalizer, but looking for the go-ahead goal. Go. Uh, then in the seven minute of stoppage time, Slolina would deny Morea from close range before he tipped uh, Mensa header over. And then Yoboa uh, heads one that, that just flashed wide off the net in the ninth minute of stoppage time. And yeah, despite the fact that Columbus were by far the better team in this one, they can't solve Slolina, and they were not being clinical in their finishing, and that was kind of the story of this game. As it ends scoreless between both of these teams, shots in this game, 25 shots compared to just 6 that the Fire has. 9 shots on goal compared to 1 that the Fire has. 10 shots off target for the 3 that the Fire has. 6 shots out of block for the 2 that the Fire has in possession. 62% possession compared to 38% possession that the Fire, of course, had in this game, and... You know, I know prob probably most likely in terms of the player of the week, it's going to come from an attacking player. And I have a feeling Hani Mukta, of course, would, would win it again, as I'll talk about a little bit later, that Nashville got another big win against Austin FC. And Mukta might have now gone into the conversation of leading the MVP race. But I got to say, say you got to give a lot lot, lot of recognition to Gaga Sloan. And like this was probably the, the not only the best performance he had ever had, but probably the best goalkeeping performance performance we have seen seen this season i mean he was just sim simply making save after save in this game and you know for the crew i know they can just easily say that it's just one of those days where they just ran into a hot goalkeeper but the problem is they have had this problem for a lot of time at at home and that as if they can't can't solve solve that they they are basically still still in that rim where they're still kind of in the playoff bubble and there's still teams that can call up to them and that they're they're still not exactly at that point where they're they're pretty much guaranteeing themselves to be be getting a play, play playoff places and especially dropping points against a fire team that look like they're done this season is not a good way to try to to hope, hope that you can get into a spot where you you're pretty much locked to make it to the playoffs this season but that being said moving on in terms of the next match and one team that is pretty much already locked to make it to the playoff i mean the philadelphia union we talked about how they they locked themselves to to the playoff playoffs in the last game and you know in this one they didn't score four goals in this one they didn't go crazy on the attacking end but they still got a two nothing win against the new york red bulls though i will say that this was a game where yeah you talk about goalkeeping andre blake was was on his game in this one and you know again for the red bulls i didn't think that they played badly in this one but they met andre blake and they definitely don't want to meet him him uh, again after this game too but uh, there was a shout for a penalty early for the Red Bulls that was not given before a year would it would hit one right to Blake. Uh, it was a promising start for the Red Bulls as they were looking to get the opener, but that, but in the 22nd minute it looked like they got the opener. Who, who Lukinias uh, tried to back heel one on the doorstep of goal, but somehow in some way Blake was able to be there, robbing him there. And again, I, I thought that early on the Union they kind of looked like they were step off on the attack and on the defensive end. They weren't as sharp as what we've seen in the past couple of games where they just simply handle manhandle 
teams game in and game out. Uh, in fact, the first big opportunity for them didn't came until the 44th minute when Matt Real, of all players, uh, just puts it wide from 12 yards out, and we had to have halftime scoreless between both of these teams. And heading into the second half, whatever Jim Curtin said to this team, it definitely fired up this team because they would score just three minutes into the second half. Another guy that has been, been red hot right now, Michael Arut, he scored here from McGlynn to give the Union a one nothing lead. And, I mean, that has to be a backbreaker for the Red Bulls because up to that point, they play a very good good, good game so far at home, which is something that they haven't done a lot this season. And then they come out of halftime conceding a, a goal go against a team that that looked like their favorite to, to win this one though earlier or though they did have a chance to equalize in the 57 minute but here comes Andre Blake again this time he robbed money up now who trying to tap it in from a point blank effort and I mean rope Blake looked like he was at it again because you know the union weren't weren't playing very well even though they of course got the go heading in, in or in the early part of the second half but you know the union can still look a little bit step off but this looks like it's one of those games where Andre Blake was just going to carry this team off his back. Going to bail out uh, some some bad defensive play that this back line, line the Union ha- has made and make some incredible both save and try to steal a win for the for the Union. Though that being said, in the 68th minute, uh, we also want to give some recognition to Carlos Cornell too because he also made a big save here denying Bedoya after just a giveaway from the Red Bulls. But then in the 74th minute. You know the Red Bulls when they of course gave the ball away on that previous play I talked about and how if you give opportunity to the Union, yeah, you're going to be punished. And they got lucky to not be punished there. Not so lucky in the 74th minute because uh, Gastak would score for Carranza to make it 2 nothing in favor of the Union. And this, of course, came from a bad turnover from the Red Bulls. You just cannot give the ball away in your own half against this Union team. They are going to pound, pounce on it every time and it's no surprise that you know the second time this is this has happened the union make sure the red bulls were were made to pay in that one though in the 81st minute edelman looked to try to get one back for the red bulls but he fires one wide and as times wind down you know the union they were kind of shutting things up and they were trying to to preserve this two nothing lead trying to make it un- uncomfortable for the red bulls to get one back actually i don't know why i wrote the union to get get one back they were Leading to nothing at that point. And it looks like they did a good job in terms of that. Because the Red Bulls didn't really threaten in the last bit in this game. Though that being said, in the second minute of stoppage time. This was a big talking point for this week. Uh, one of the many big talking points for this week. As Drew Drew Yearwood would, of course, would get get a a red card. Actually, he, he got a double yellow card in, in terms of this sequence. First, he, of course, kicked the ball into to the stands and actually hit one of the the red bulls fans so he kind of had a kaku moment there and i will say for drew yearwood you know how how should i say say this in a way where you know i kind of kind of do feel a little bit bad for him in a way where you can clearly see he, he didn't meant to do that and he was definitely frustrated i mean you see when when players are are down in the game and you're incredibly frustrated you sometimes see see player kick the ball into the advertisement board but well, the dangerous thing about that is that if you kick it too hard it can hit a fan in the the front row and that that is exactly what happened and you you can definitely see your was very remorseful that's why he went into the the stands and apologized that and you know again i i can i understand why maybe that red bulls fan that tried trying to condemn your wood and was not happy with his, his action is why exactly he, he did that, but at the same same time, you know, you could see Yearwood was clearly remorse, remorseful, and even tweeted out that he he def, definitely w- was very upset about that action, and that he promised he'll never do it again. And yeah, that's something that I think it's good good to see because again, I don't think Drew Yearwood has that reputation of being a a dirty player, and that this was just one of those incidents where he simply made a mistake, he lost his composure. We see that even with some of the best athletes in the the world, and that yeah, you know, I think. Even though he's going to be be suspended in this game, I think you know the 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 amount of negative comments I've, I've have heard on online about about Yearwood action. I think that was a little bit overboard. Yes, it was bad, and it was very similar to the Kaku incident a couple of years ago. But at least with this in, incident, at least Yearwood does show a little bit more remorse, and he actually apologized in that sequence. I mean, he, he's going to get suspended maybe for mo- multiple games, but. You know, at least it's good to, to see 
see a player acknowledging the fact that he made a terrible mistake and that he would definitely promise that he'll never do it again. Though, that being said, in the end, the Union does win 2 0 in this one. And the shots in this one, eight shots compared to five that the Union has. Both teams had three shots on goal, one shot off target for both of these teams, four shots that was blocked for the one that the Union has. And possession wise, 55% possession compared to 45% possession that the Union has in this game. Now, uh, moving on in terms of the next game. We got FC Cincinnati versus Charlotte FC. And boy, the first half of this game, man, it was played in a mon monsoon weather. I mean, this game looked very similar to, remember when Orlando City played against NYCFC, I think, in the last match week, how that was played under monsoon weather for, for part of the first half. And, and it was kind of the case for the first 20 minutes because not only nothing happened in the first 20 minutes of this game, but the rain might be a factor because chances w was not only at a premium in that one, but it just feels like they were just playing in in a lake with the way how how it is. And again, I'm kind of surprised maybe maybe the referee didn't just stop the game. I mean, I know there was no lightning around the area, and you can of course play play in the r rain, and the only time you sh should stop a game is because of, of lightning. But sometimes that you might even need to stop the game just because because maybe the pitch is just getting getting water. A little bit because again you know in this case the rain was definitely a factor in this one neither team of course was going on though i will say that maybe using the word water log is a little bit exaggerated because it wasn't really the the case when you watch this game though that being said in the 37 minute uh the first big opportunity came as there was chaos in the charlotte box but uh since then he wasn't able to capitalize though they would capitalize the a chance in the 38th minute as Nick Haglund would score from Acosta to make it one nothing in favor of Cincinnati. Not only that's the first shot for Cincinnati, but I think that was the first shot uh, of the game. Uh, it was a great delivery there from Lucho Acosta from the corner. And Haglund, we know that he can definitely score a headed goal, goal before. And he d does it here to give Cincinnati a one nothing lead. And then Cameron tried to do, do the same thing, but he heads it wide in the 40th minute before Acosta hits the side netting in the 44th minute. And I feel like the goal rejuvenated Cincinnati because, again, up to that point, neither of these teams was attacking much, but that goal really kind of sparked the, the team that, that took the lead to try to get get the second goal. In fact, they were trying to press to, well, actually not to press to get one back, but more like press to try to get that second goal before halftime. But we ha do head to halftime with Cincinnati leading one nothing. Now in the second half, this is when Charlotte started to kind of wake up and realize that, yeah, our playoff hope is on the line. We got to at least get, get a resort or even get a win to keep our our our, our fringe playoff hopes alive. Because in the 47th minute, uh, Salantano would deny Bronico in the front post before USV would head it straight to Salantano. This was probably one of the better games for, for USV, who has been a very disappointing signing for for Charlotte this season, a guy that you know there was, there was some promise that he could be decent in MLS, but he has really haven't haven't had a lot uh, of success so far this season. But there was no doubt that Charlotte was on the front foot and they were pressing to get the equalizer. Used me up with heads one right to Santano in in the the front post in the 65th minute before Melinda had a shot from close range that was deflected. It, but it goes wide, and again, I thought Cincinnati they were on the ropes, and this is the thing about Cincinnati this season at home. You know, just because they they have a, a comfortable lead, you know, they, it seems like they could sometimes go back to old habits and, of course, concede that that goal. Uh, and, in fact, in the 79th minute, Acosta really had the first big opportunity for Cincinnati in the second half. But he puts that one, one wide there. But in the 81st minute, uh, Cincinnati would kill this game off. It's Lucho Acosta scoring from Kubo to make it 2 nothing in favor of Cincinnati. But they maybe want to fake Nuno Santo. For, for this goal because you know Nuno Santos scores making his debut for Charlotte FC and I talk about how so far this season you know most players make their debut it's been pretty good that's not the case for Nuno Santos this was a nightmare debut for him just come off the the the, the uh, come off as a substitute to making his his MLS debut and he basically gifted the ball right to Yaya Kubo and yeah that of course was the 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 final nail in the coffin for Charlotte, or well, I wouldn't say the final nail in the coffin, but that was more like a death blow for Charlotte FC. See who again up to that point they looked like they're the better team, and then they can see see to pretty much had no chance of coming back to even win this one. And Acosta did try try to chip Kalina, but uh, Kalina did tip that one over before Sergio Santos would flash one 
wide from close range. And again, momentum seems like it's back with Cincinnati. This is similar to the first goal. As soon as they score a goal there, it seems like they were pushing to trying to get that that third goal. And you can definitely see Charlotte, they look like they were down and out ever since they could see that second goal. I mean, the mentality of this team it was clearly, clearly took a hit after they give up uh, a second goal after they were chasing for the equalizer. Uh, Barrio would had a, a volley that goes right into to Kalina before Reyna had to just watch on the header in the 90th minute. But yeah, in the end, Cincinnati with a big 2 nothing win to get themselves back above the red line. And the shots in this one, 14 shots apiece for both of these teams. Five shots on goal for the two that Shard has. Six shots off target for the three that Shard has. Three shots that was blocked for the nine that Shard has. And possession-wise, 64% possession compared to 36% possession that FC Cincinnati has in this game. And like I said, for Charlotte, you knew that coming into this game, they need to win if they want to keep their fringe playoff hope alive. And with this loss, I think you could say that their playoff hope is pretty much all, all but but CO and that. You know, judging by the year that Charlotte has, I feel like this has been a very expansion se season for Charlotte FC. I mean, we, we talk about how it's always hard to make it to the playoffs in their expansion year because they have faced a lot of obstacles expansion team tends to face a lot of obstacles that go through but you know with charlotte of, of the many obstacles that they have to face both on and off the pitch it's kind of a miracle the fact that they've been in this playoff race for for as long as possible but it just feels like maybe they just run out out of steam a little bit uh down the stretch but it also doesn't help the fact that they just have such a murderous row to finish the se season and that it doesn't get any easier for, for them and that that's kind of the reason why maybe their playoff hope is all but sealed. But that being said, I am now going to switch board and look at the next game that is going to, to happen in terms of a, a, a mega review that I'm doing, uh, looking at all the 13 games that happened in match week number 29. So moving on into the next game, we got Nashville and Austin FC, and it's safe to say that Nashville might have just finally found their strive and that, you know, this is probably the perfect time for, to, for them to finally find found the strife because you know remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about how nashville was below the red line and it looks like it was all doom and gloom and their captain dax mccarty definitely sound off about how this team was underachieving well it seems like this whole nashville team probably listened to him because ever since that pep talk this team has completely rejuvenized in a way where they're now all the way up to fourth place in the western conference and they definitely sent a big message to the league after getting a big three nothing win against austin fc now uh, in the first half, and by the way, this is the, the last game to finish off in terms of the Saturday action because, you know, as I said, with a mega review that I'm talking about, I usually, usually don't talk uh, or I usually finish the video talk about, well, this is the la last game and wrap it up. But because I'm doing a mega review looking at the Saturday and Sunday game, just want to mention this is the la last Saturday game that I'm going to talk about. Though it was a re relatively late one because the game was delayed for an hour because of lightning and the kickoff of course starts at 829 i mean between nashville and orlando city i think they're fighting for the award of who has the most wet weather delay i mean i know the southeast are notorious in terms of weather delay which is why you know i think Atlanta's is probably happy the fact that they built themselves that that retractable roof stadium that is mercedes-benz stadium but yeah you know i know a lot of these mls teams don't have that luxury to to do so so yeah you know in this game unfortunately uh, it was delayed for about an hour, but it did kick off in a in a time where it wasn't at super late. It was 8:29 uh, p.m. local time. Uh, but by the time it did kick off, uh, Austin actually were the better side early in this one. Uh, Willis did tip Kalmanich shot over before Drew UC hits one right to Willis, and like I mentioned, Austin I thought they started out the better side, and we know this team is a very good good road team, and they were looking to try to get another big road win. Though uh, Stuver did deny Schaffelberg after he went through on goal. And I'm going to say it again. Jacob Schaffelberg, he has looked like a, a man that has has been been, been on, not only on a mission, but just looked like a rejuvenate player now that he's with Nashville SC. And this is a good example of what happened when you do have a change of scenery, go to a, a new team and finally get some, some minutes. Because, you know, during his time with TFC, you can see he was definitely in low confidence. But now... Getting, getting the opportunity to play for Nashville and getting minutes and that, you know, in his early day, he has really shown that he has been a, could be a lethal weapon for this Na Nashville SC side, especially on the wing. Uh, though Sapon then hits one straight to Stuver in the 10th minute and after a slow start, I thought Nashville have woke up and they were pressing to try to get the opening goal. Schaffelberg had a chance in the 
fifth minute, but he hits it wide before. There was a bit of a chaos in the Nashville box as Houston actually had a shot that was pinballed off of two Nashville defender, and that one actually was going in. So if that one went in, it would be very interesting to see whether if that was maybe an own goal on one of the Nashville defender or is it a Houston goal. But either way, uh, that one was going toward on goal and somehow Nashville was able to clear that one off the line. Like That would have been one of the, the, the most scrappiest goal I've see, seen a team score this season. But fortunately for Nashville, it wasn't the case. Though uh, Houston did have another opportunity in the 40th minute, but he hits one just wide from 17 yards out. And we had to have time scoreless between both of these teams. Though we wouldn't be stay scoreless for long heading into the second half. Because in the 48th minute, Walker Zimmerman would score from Lovett to make it one nothing in favor of Nashville. And when Walker Zimmerman scored, you know most likely it's probably from a header. And it is. I mean, this was a classic Nashville set piece. Beautiful delivery there from Lovett. And we know Walker Zimmerman is, a, is always a threat in the air. And he basically pounds on that one to give Nashville a one nothing lead. In fact, he almost... Score an identical goal just three minutes later, uh, but this time he hits, hits it right to Stuart and Austin. Again, they had no answer in terms of containing Zimmerman from the corner. And this season, we have seen seen before where Austin has been kind of vulnerable in terms of set piece defending. Uh, Schaffelberg then hits one just wide from close range before Sapon puts one just wide from 13 yards out. It's been all Nashville uh, ever since the ha halftime whistle, and they were. Uh, were uh, pushing to try to kill this game off. Though, uh, Rigoni did hit one right to Willis before he blasts a free kick over the bar. But in the 82nd minute, they do get get the, the crucial second goal. And who else but Honey Mukta? I mean, we talked about the battle in this one between Mukta and Dre UC, And I feel like whoever's going to win this battle most likely is going to win the MVP. Safe to say that Mukta won this battle because he gets on the score sheet and he just kind of looked a little bit better in this game compared to Dre UC. But... Yeah, he scored here from Alex Muriel to make it 2-0 in favor of Nashville. Though, that probably wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for a terrible giveaway from Gabrielson. And that's another thing that has been a big problem for Los, Los Verdes this season. How many times have Austin given the ball away on, on the defensive end that had led, led to them being punished? Like, that's something that, you know, I talked about er, earlier how, how how when it comes to, to Minnesota United and how bad they're back back line is and how concerned I have when they head to the playoffs. I gotta say the same thing about Austin FC. Like, this back line just does not look like a championship caliber back line and that you make those mistakes in the playoffs, you're going to not only be, be punished, but it could, it could come back to to bite you big time. Though, in the 84th minute, Dre UC did look to try to get one back, but he is denied by Willis. And then in the first minute of stoppage time, Mokhtawi gets on the score sheet again. He scored from Moore and McCarty to make it 3 nothing in favor of Nashville, and that was a classic Nashville counterattack. I mean, you know that this is a team that, that live and, and almost die by set-piece and counterattack, and this is exactly one, one of them giving the 3 nothing lead. And to make matters worse, uh, Musa Jite would also get a du double yellow card to, of course, get himself sent off. I think one of them was descent, and then, of course, the other one was putting his hand in the opponent's face, which I feel like that, that should have been a red card in, in, in it. In itself, the way that you know, when you put your hands in the opponent's face, it's usually an automatic record. Well, it usually is, but with how inconsistent sometimes MLS is, um, you know, it kind of depends on it. But it's definitely a yellow card, and again, the the descent, of course, cost us the second ye yellow card there. And yeah, that pretty much wrapped up a very bad day at the office for Austin FC. And in the end, they they suffer a three nothing loss against a a rejuvenated Nashville side. As the shots in this one, 15 shots for the 10 that Austin had, 6 shots on goal for the 5 that Austin has, 4 shots off target for the 3 that Nashville has, 6 shots that was blocked for the 1 that Austin has, and possession-wise, 59% possession compared to the 41% possession that Nashville has. And if Nashville can continue this good form that they've been in, nobody want to play them. And this is, this is the thing about teams that win MLS Cup. When you get yourself hot at the right time and make a run into to the playoffs, you can definitely win MLS Cup. And if, as long as if Nashville can continue to go well. I mean, they still have a couple games to play, and, you know, there is that danger of maybe peaking a little bit too soon, but, you know, in the case of Nashville, where they were just a couple of weeks ago, uh, be, being uh, below the red line, and there was question of whether or not Gary Smith could be fired from, from this team. It's been a great, great uh, comeback for, for this team, and now got themselves in a spot where it was kind of unthinkable that they might, might get a home play off game. I mean, a couple of weeks, they were just thinking about making the playoffs. 
Now they can potentially get a home playoff game at Geodes Park, which, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, they have done much better recently at Geodes Park, but, you know, the record at home is still not, not great and that they need to win a couple more games to prove. They maybe finally feel comfortable playing at, at their, their brand new, new stadium that they find themselves having problems a lot throughout the season. But moving on in the next match. We got the Portland Timbers versus Atlanta United. And again, coming into this game, this was definitely a crucial game in terms of the playoff position in both conferences. Again, anytime when that, of course, happens, you know, if you're an Eastern Conference team in those playoff hunt, you're rooting for the Timbers. If you're a Western Conference team, team that is in the playoff hunt you're rooting for Atlanta and United and in the end it's those Eastern Conference team in the play that is battling for the playoffs are going to be the more happier one because the Timbers were able to win 2-1 in this game against Atlanta and United a game where it kind of had that playoff kind of kind of feeling with the way that there was just so much at stake in this one in fact it it, it was the case at least early on as it was a very cagey start like both of these teams know how big this ga game is and they don't really want to take a risk to go down one nothing early in this one uh moreno then slides that that wide from close range before chara would blast one into the stands and i thought the timbers started to get some momentum while atlanta they were looking a little bit suspect on the defensive end uh blanco would then drill a free kick 20 yards out and 25 minutes in atlanta still had had yet to register a shot though that kind of, kind of was a bit of a jinx because in the 26th minute they would register their 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 first shot so uh it was Sosa the one that had the fir first shot as he hits that one wide and I also wrote that it just feels like it's a playoff game like things were being tight there was a couple of half chances but there was no score up to that point Ivasic then denied Arujo who went through on goal there that was a glorious opportunity for Luis Arujo but he couldn't put it away and it would come back to haunt Atlanta because just five minutes later a penalty will be given to the Timbers after Perota bought down Moreno in the box penalty would be the difference in in this one because both of the goals that the Timbers score was from the spot and Santiago Moreno stepped up and he buries the the penalty to make it one nothing in favor of the Timbers by the way speaking of penalty there was a lot of penalties this week that was saved and we'll definitely talk about that pen penalty in one of those games that maybe be, be a penalty that could cost a team in term, terms of making the playoffs this season. But we do head to halftime with the Timbers leading one nothing, And in the second half, they're trying to make it 2 nothing as Zach McGraw trying to stab it in from close. But he missed wide in the back post. And with the playoffs, hope on the line. It doesn't seem like Atlanta is, is playing with some urgency. I mean, they have looked very flat and uninspiring trying, trying to, to come from behind. And in some way, that maybe that kind of kind of helped them, and maybe they kind of read, read that a little bit, because they eventually do show some more promise on the attack and on the build-up, but the final ball is just lacking, which kind of just sum up Atlanta United's season, and maybe their, their cases for the past couple of years. Though uh, Sosa did blast it, wide, uh, uh, blast it way high from long range before Lorea tried to kill this game off, but he blasted that one high, and then the Timbers had a chance to kill it off the game off in the 83rd minute as a penalty was given to the Timber after Sosa bought down Chara in the box, which this time it's Darren Ospria, the one that steps in to take the penalty, and he buries that one to make it 2-0 in favor of the Portland Timbers, though the game was back down to a one-goal goal, uh, game when Joseph Martinez coming off the bench in this one as he scored for Moreno to make it 2-1 in favor of the Timbers. Again, it's kind of weird to see Joseph Martinez coming all off the bench as a super sub and you know that he does not enjoy that like so far most of the goals that he have scored in these past couple of games it's been kind of muted celebration you know how pissed he, he is with, with where Atlanta United is this season and especially pissed of the role that he's now pl playing not regularly starting in in this in in this Atlanta team although Nishkoda looked to try to restore that two goal lead but the the ball was clear off the line by Atlanta before Godinho uh Getting his first start as a goalkeeper for Atlanta. He hits it just wide from, from close range. And yes, I'm not kidding. He actually was the one that was at the end, end of that corner. Like if he puts that one into the back of net. Oh boy. There's going to be not only crazy things that we'll see in me, me Monday on the MLS Reddit page. But that would be one of the rare times we see a goalkeeper ends up on on the, the score sheet in an MLS game. But yeah, in the end, the Timbers were able to win 2-1 against Atlanta. And the shots of this one, 14 shots connected 
or 14 shots compared to 10 that Atlanta has. Uh, four shots on goal compared to two that Atlanta has. Four shots off target for the seven that the Timbers had. Four shots that was blocked compared to three that the Timbers had. And possession-wise, 62% possession compared to 38% possession that the Portland Timbers had in this game. And while the Timbers' playoff hope is truly alive and that I don't think this should be a big surprise consider, again, you know, when you win the Cascadia Derby, it, it can definitely change your, your season and it's definitely changing for the the Timbers right now, but less so for Orlando United, who, again, you know, they pretty much are now jo joining, joining Charlotte as a team that, yeah, there looks like they're they're done in terms of the playoffs, and that, again, I feel like this offseason, there's going to be a lot of soul-searching that ne needs to be made, and maybe you could say that Gonzalo Pineda could be on the hot seat a, a little bit, because not only the fact that he has not delivered this te team in terms of making... Uh, get going deep into the playoffs, but not even making the playoffs and look like a team, team like in 2020 when they they play some un, uninspiring soccer and miss out on the playoffs. Yeah, you know there there's definitely going to be a lot of things that need to change this off season. A lot of soul searching that needs to be done for Atlanta this off season. But that being said, uh, moving on in terms of the next match is DC versus Colorado. So just like the other nil nil draw that I talked about earlier. This is a game that probably shouldn't end in nil nil if the finishing was better, especially from the home team and specifically uh, on one player that is Christian Benteke. And you know, I know that Benteke, of course, haven't really been getting a lot of uh, hype compared to maybe some of the more well-known player that has come to MLS. And I think this game maybe is the reason why, because yeah, he, I mean, he, uh, it is stunned. I am stunned the fact that he did not get on the score sheet with just so many opportunity. In, in, in this one and it all started in the second minute when he hits it into the side netting after uh off of a deflection and then he had a free header from from close range but he somehow missed that one wide and and even though i thought dc was all over colorado early in in this game and we're looking for the opener you know it maybe it was kind of a sign that uh oh is this going to be one of those games where maybe the home team is not being clinical in terms of their their finishing and also, you know, in a rapid standpoint, this was definitely not what they wanted to do. Like, you know, this is a team that, that are just hanging into those fringe play, playoff hope and that they ne desperately need a win. And the fact that they got completely played out of the park in the first 15 minutes, not a great start for Robin Frazier team. Though, to give them credit, they did start to get back into this game as the first shot did came from them in the 19 minute. Uh, as Felipe Gutierrez shot was somehow clear off the line and you know that one went in that would have been completely against the run of plays and Speaking of scoring they did actually put it in the back of net in the 22nd minute But the problem is Rubio was in an offside position and therefore the goal was disallowed But there was no doubt that Colorado has woke up after just a terrible start to this game And they kind of sense that yeah, they they need to win this game if They want to keep their fringe playoff hopes alive uh, Barrios then puts one one wide from close range before Ochoa denied Rubio from long range. And we had to have time scoreless between both of these teams. Now, in the second half, Ochoa would deny Estevez. But he kind of kind of palms that one right into the path of Zardes. And Zardes had a chance to follow that one up. But he puts that one wide. Uh, and then there was a penalty that was given to DC after Rosenberry hand balled that one in the box. And in step Benteke, who had a chance to announce himself to MOS and announce himself to DC from the the spot and had a chance to finally score his first career MLS go and yeah no he was denied by Yarbo it was not or Yarbro and that was not a good pe penalty from from Christian Benteke uh but in the 67 minute Yarbo then denied Birnbaum on the header as Steven Birnbaum all of a sudden looked like he's a he could be a threat going for on the on the goal scoring department after scoring hit his, his first goal in the last game and then Benteke had a header that was clear off the line in the 68th minute. And at that point, I just simply wrote that, you know, even though this is only two games in for Christian Benteke in his time with DC United, you look like he's been state bit. Like, you, you'd see the, the amount of chances that, that he has, and especially with him having a, a chance to finally score his first goal for DC from the spot, and he missed it, and now he had a header that was clear off the line. Yeah, it looked like he, he is state state bid and that is definitely not great great news for dc because they were hoping maybe they, they might see the benteke that they might see during his day, days with aston villa and and in some extent doing his, his day, days early days with liverpool but what they've gotten is the recent christian benteke and a guy that no 
no wonder why he, he has, hasn't really been getting a lot uh, offer, and especially kind of been a castaway in, in the Premier League in the last couple years with his bad finishing. Uh, though in the 80th minute, Obubakar did hit, hit one that is denied by Ochoa. But again, Ochoa, you know, we know that he has that tendency of allowing juicy rebounds, and he allowed this one to Zardes here, but he Zardes wasn't able to capitalize. Then Max missed wide from long range, and despite the fact that there was some, some good opportunity for Colorado to get the three points, they weren't able to do so as it ends scoreless in this one. Shots in this one, 16 shots for the 13 that Colorado has, four shots on going for the three that the Rapids had, four shots off target for the five that the Rapids had, eight shots that was blocked for the five that the Rapids had, and possession wise, 51% possession compared to the 49% possession that the Colorado Rapids has in this game. And you know what? You know, with this draw, I think that pretty much maybe be is that for the Rapids because again you know as I said in the beginning of this video there this was really the week where we are have started seeing a lot of teams that are started to to pretty much have their playoff hopes got up in smoke and that some of those teams that is near the the bubble or just above the red line had a big week in terms in terms of getting a reserve and in the case of the Rapids with them just skip, just being so far behind now and that they needed to get that three points in this game against it a, a relatively weak DC team. They don't do that, and it seems like their their playoff hopes maybe is all but but gone. Speaking of a team that also have their playoff hopes all but gone, that team would be TFC. And this Canadian Classic, man, this looked like a Canadian Classic from the MLS's back tournament. And it's also still kind of funny the fact that the scoreline would be actually the same as the Canadian Classic we saw in the MLS's back tournament because. Yeah, basically no defense was played in this this one, especially in in the first half. And it all started with this goal scoring fest happened in the second minute when a penalty was given to TFC after VAR deemed that Piet brought down Akinola in the box. And yeah, that was clearly a penalty. It was just a, a clumsy challenge there from Samuel Piet bringing down Akinola in the box. So in in step uh, Benedeski from the spot, and we know Benedeski has had a, a very good record in terms of scoring penalty i think they even mentioned he, he's been perfect from the spot and he remained perfect as he buries that one to give tfc a one nothing lead two minutes later tfc would make it two nothing as insigne would puts that one into the back then and you're al already thinking that maybe this could be a thrashing maybe this could be a, a win where you know tfc can finally break out and that they might keep their fringe playoff hope alive but little did we know that that's all the funds that twenty nine thousand fans inside bmo field would have because in the 19th minute this is when montreal woke up and it all started with kamar miller scoring here to make it 2-1 in favor of tfc and then just two minutes later it would be tied up as georgi mihajevic would score from wanyama to tie the game up at two apiece and while it was a great goal from georgi mihajevic i feel like bona should have done better i mean yes mihajevic did hits this one well from long range but it looked like this one maybe just hits it straight to bono and you know, knowing the fact that Bono has definitely not had a good season with TFC, and there's been times where he has has, has giving up some soft goals. This this is no surprise that it ha happened again in this one. But there was no doubt that I can't resist by saying that not only this was a shade of the MLS's back term in Canadian Classic, where that was also a g game, like I said, it ended 4-3, and, and that defense was kind of optional. Uh, this was kind of the, the case in this one, and that there was some serious MLS after dark energy in this one too uh wanyama then then had a chance to make it free too and probably should have done it if he didn't had had his teammate syndrome that is the romel kyoto to syndrome i mean I, I know i've been very harsh on romel kyoto in terms of his his miss and i'll never forget that that miss he had had uh a couple of year, years ago from one yard out but yeah this was just as bad as that i mean he had wanyama had an empty net to head this one one in all he has to do is just kind of put, put a head into it, and he somehow puts that one high. And that's just, again, one of those ones that it's harder to miss from that range than actually score on that. And you know, no one Yama, not only is heads in hand, but he he's probably, at that moment, he's probably was thinking that he's that one is going to definitely haunt him for the rest of the night. I mean, in the end, that one did, I think he'll sleep a little bit easier knowing the fact that eventually his team did win. But imagine if they did. Montreal didn't win. That would be one that is going to haunt ha Wanyama for for a, a long time. Though, that being said, speaking of Wan Wanyama, uh, do, he even had had a a more terrible thing happen in the 31st minute after he basically gifted right to to Akinola and Akinola could not capitalize that 
that one as he puts that one wide and this is when i basically wrote the defense they were they seems to be 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 non-existent in this game in fact they seem to be in the canadian national exhibition right now rather than actually at this game and for those of you that don't know what the canadian national exhibition is but it's basically like a state state fair fair uh that that we see seen around each of the states here in the u.s and that you can definitely see in the background they were having having the those kind of typical state fair kind of rides and also food option but it seems like the defense were having too much fun in terms of that because boy oh boy it was not there was no defense that was found in in this game and it would kind of continue because in the 32nd minute uh kamar looked like he puts it into the back end to make it free two, but the goal was disallowed for offside but four minutes later he would get on the score sheet and yeah this was shocking defending from Mavenga. first giving the ball ball away but also just sim simply getting out man but by Kai Kamara. I mean, I know Mavinga it is getting up up to that that age, but to just simply get out man like Kai Kamara like that, yeah, that that was kind of embarrassing, and that yeah that gives Montreal the lead. Um, you know, you know, it's hard to believe that this game was at two nothing just thirty minutes ago, and now all of a sudden it was three two. Though it could have been three three in the fifth minute of stoppage time when Insigne just puts it to wide there, and after just a wild first half where defense was not a thing thing whatsoever we had to have time in the canadian class seat with a free two lead for montreal now in the second half kyoto had a free header but he hits it right to bono but then in the four fifty or in the 54th minute montreal would make it 4-2 it's alistair johnston scoring from kamara in kyoto to make it 4-2 in favor of montreal and yeah toronto has completely capitulated like four unanswered goal for montreal in, in this one and it, it, it's not like they, they score four goals in a long time it's four goals in in a span of just 30 minutes it's just comp like that defense for for tfc you know i mean i know montreal their defense was not good but that defense for tfc was also so so non-existent and just again completely capitulated in a way where where you know i'll talk about how this may be the death blow for for tfc like you cannot come back back from 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 it's gonna be or at least i would say it's gonna be hard to come back to try try trying to maybe have any hopes of the playoffs when you have this kind uh, of performance especially against your rival though that being said they did try to make it interesting late as mark anthony k would hit it wide from close range and again tfc was starting to get back into this game and i fought for montreal they got to be careful because the two goal lead that they had it can definitely wipe away e e easily especially where no defense was found in this one uh bernadeski then blasted high on the free kick and as the time winds down you know toronto they were really pressing to get one back but at least for the last 15 minutes we did kind of start to see defense being played a little bit especially on the montreal side though as soon as i said that uh montreal would give up a third goal as insigne did give some the home fans a little bit hope that they maybe can can make this a 4-4 game but in the end it was a little bit too too late to do so as Montreal with a 4-3 win against TFC and might have just ended TFC hope of making the playoffs as the shots in this one. 11 shots compared to the 9 that Montreal has. 4 shots on goal per the 6 that Montreal has. 3 shots off target for the 6 that TFC had. 1 shot that was blocked compared to the none that Montreal has. And possession-wise, 42% possession compared to the 58% possession that Montreal has in this game. Overall, it was a crazy game in this Canadian Class C, but a crazy game that TFC definitely will not enjoy and that again I think think it's going to be hard to try to recover from from this and that they will absolutely need a miracle called this now that to make it to the playoffs and that I think it's also not a big surprise that if I do make my moving forward series video which I'll start making it because I know some teams are getting close to getting eliminated from from the playoffs but yeah you know you know for TFC I won't be surprised in my moving forward series the most obvious thing I would say that went, went wrong for them is defense, 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 and also goal, goalkeeping throughout the season. But that being said, I am now going to switch board and look at the next four games that happened in terms of this mega 13 game review. Well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll look at the next three games because I'll kind of split split it into um, the third board into three games and then the final board, I'll, I'll look at the two games. So yeah, I'll look at the next three games th that that happened in terms of the match week number 29 action so moving on in the next game is the galaxy versus sporting kc and throughout this review i talk about how there's been a lot of missed penalty but i think this game 
probably had the one that is the most talked about, not only in MLS this week, but really in the world in general. And we'll definitely get to that that penalty that was missed in this one that could potentially come back to haunt the Galaxy if they do not make it to the playoffs this year. Now, early on, uh, just one minute into the game, Sherry did hit a one-hopper right to Bond before Chicharito actually gets on the score sheet in the fourth minute. He scored from Vasquez and Pew to give the Galaxy a one nothing lead, and that's actually a big goal for Chicharito because that's his 200th career goal in his career. So, in a career that has been just so so marvelous that we have seen with Chicharito, uh, that's definitely a, a great moment for him reaching 200 career goal. Even though, technically, I feel like he... he probably had more because I feel it like during his career you know especially during his time in Europe I thought he, he definitely had scored a, a lot of go goals where at a way where you would think that he probably would be be at 300 right now but here it's his 200 career goal and yeah that gives the Galaxy a dream start in this game though uh, Sporting KC were quickly looking to try to get one back uh, Tommy would hit one right to Bond before Voltaire actually puts it into the back of the net for Sporting KC but the problem is the goal was disallowed for offside. But it's a good response for Sporting KC. You know, they they were down early in this game. And this is the thing about Sporting KC lately. This is a team that has not looked like, like the, the same team that we've seen all season long. And that's actually a good thing. Because Sporting KC for the majority of this season has been really bad. And you just feel like they've been really rejuvenized in these last couple uh, of games. Even though I know it's pretty much meaningless. Because they're pretty much done in terms of making... The playoffs and they've been in see you next season mode for a very long long time now though uh agata then hits it just high from close range in the 39th minute and we had to have time for the galaxy leading one nothing in this game in the second half uh chicharito would put it wide in the front post before agata hits one uh right to bond in the 54th minute and this is when yeah buckle up boys and girls because it is time for some mos after dark cut kind of craziness in in this game and i mentioned there's going to be some mos after dark kind of craziness in this game earlier well now we you you know that there will be because it all started in the 65th minute when a penalty was given to sporting kc after williams handballed that one in the in the box which russell was able to put that one away to tie the game up at one apiece not long after uh felipe hernandez would score in the 76th minute as he scored from agata to make it 2-1 in favor of sporting kc and while that Definitely was a fortunate goal for Felipe Hernandez because it took a wicked deflection off of Araujo. You know, Sporting Casey, I thought up to that point were were the the better team, and yeah, you know they they now lead the two one against the Galaxy. But then uh, before they had a chance to maybe celebrate them getting all three points on the road, a penalty was get, given to the Galaxy now. After a post game bought down Edwards in the box, which Chicharito steps up and he puts away the penalty to tie the game up at two apiece. Before another penalty was rewarded to the Galaxy after VR deemed that Pierre handballed that one in the box. And indeed that was the right call because you can clearly see, see he, he basically had an outstretched arm uh, when that ball hit, hits his hand. So Chicharito gets a, a chance to be the hero and not only the hero in this game, but get a hat trick. And... And, you know, what could go wrong in, in, in this with the way that Chicharito has had an amazing game? Well, everything went wrong because he decided to try try a Panenka goal in this one. And, you know, this is the thing about Panenka. And I, I said, said this before. When you try a Panenka, there's a lot, lot of risk in involvement. Because if it gets right, then it's definitely something spe spectacular and something you could even say borderline just absolute disgusting but at the same time if you get it wrong oh boy <laughs> you are going to definitely get 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 nailed by your head coach and also your your fan base about that and not only the fact that Chicharito tried the Penenka and that he, he did it did it badly because that ball you know when you tried the Penenka you want to try to make maybe lift the ball high up and then dink it in well he didn't do that that ball was kind of just just barely up the ground there and it's no surprise the post game basically read that that one perfectly like he, he read that one perfectly and he helps on that and yeah that is basically an example of what what happened when a penantica goes horribly wrong and why this is going to be a moment that you know as i said before you know if the galaxy don't make it to the playoffs this season and if they even just miss like one or two points uh in the playoffs this is going to be the game they're going to look back 
on and you know i know it's going to be unfair to say say that chicharito simple handily cost them the game because overall you know chicharito did had a good game up to that point and that you know the two goals that the galaxy scored was from from their talus number nine but when you were basically the leader of this team and when you had a chance to basically get your team a huge free point to get get yourself back above the red line and you do that yeah you're going to get a lot lot of heat and you, you i think in some way you you probably deserve to be be at fault in terms of costing your team a win and maybe costing your team of making the playoffs too but either way uh as i said it ends in a 2-2 draw and the shots in this one 15 shots created 11 that the galaxy had both team had five shots on goal five shots off target with a six that sporting gaze he had four shots that was blocked for the one that the galaxy had and possession wise 60 percent possession compared to 40 percent possession that sporting case he had but like i said the big talking point is that pananka can miss and that yeah like i said you know galaxy fans are better hope that that's not gonna gonna come back to to bite them because we know that they have been been infamous in terms of late pl playoffs uh hope being, being snatched away and and heartbreak of missing the playoffs on decision day and that yeah again you know and it doesn't also help the fact that they're playing against the houston dynamo on decision day the team that they definitely do not want to face on decision because it feels like that's always the team that basically broke their hearts in terms of missing the playoffs but that being said moving on in the next match is New England versus NYCFC. So you know how earlier I said FC Cincinnati is back above the red line. Well, that all changed when New England uh, decided to get a big 3 nothing win against NYCFC. Though, I would say that this is a classic example of a match of what happened when one team is more clinical in front of goal and the other isn't. And the team that was more clinical get the big win. The other gets it. Gets it. Another loss. Though, again, uh, this was also a game where, you know, Georgie Pet. Petrovic, you know, I know he probably won't get the 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 the, the nod of winning goalkeeper of the year. In fact, I don't even know if he's going to maybe even get final nomination for that. But I feel like he 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 probably should be because he has just ever since he came came to New England, you know, not only the fact that he has been been a, a top tier goalkeeper level, but it's getting to a point where I don't think any refs fan really miss Matt Turner, and you know that's not nothing to go against with Matt Turner. I mean, Turner is definitely a great goalkeeper and he probably could be the number one for this U.S. men's national team heading to the World Cup. But the quality that Petrovic has, has brought, I mean, I won't, I won't say it's just as, as good, uh, is even better than Turner because Turner was just amazing. But I would say it's equally as good. good, And that, it, it, as I said, you know, the quality that Petrovic has brought to this Revs team in between the stakes just made a lot of refs for, for, forgot that, you know, they, they don't really kind of miss Matt Turner at at all because they just had had a, a direct replacement for him. But in the fifth minute, uh, po Poster had a low ring shot that was tipped over by Johnson before Andrade uh, hits it right to Petrovic. But then in the tenth minute, New England would take the lead, and it's John Bell, the one that gets the opening goal for the refs. It's been a while since John Bell has scored a goal here, but he scored here though. You, you can basically thank the optional defense being there from NYCFC, like the fact that he was just wide open in the box like that, yeah, there is definitely a lot of question in terms of so of how that that happened. And again, you know, NYCFC, this defense was supposed to be ta Taylor as one of the best defense in the league, and for a while it has been. But man, these last couple of games, that has not been been the case. And again, you know, losing Alexander Callens uh, to injury, it has been. It, I think. You know, everybody has talked about, about losing Tati Castellanos has really been kind of a downfall for, for NYCFC. And I'll, and I'll kind of mention it in a bit because they had a couple of opportunity in, in this game where if Tati was there, NYCFC probably would would have at least scored a goal in this one. But losing Alexander Callens, they're really, really they're, 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 they're heart and soul now for, for, this, for this defense. It's definitely created a big, big hole in terms of that defense. Fences of, or that back line for that NYCFC team, and we're, we're basically seeing it right now. Uh, but Petrovic then denied Janssen from close range before he denied Morales as the flag, of course, went up. Uh, Aber then puts it wide from close range in the 20th minute. He actually went through on goal there, Aber. And again, that's one that, you know, if that was Tati Castellanos, that would have been in the back of the net. But, you know, with Aber, he's definitely he's been a guy that, you know, he has not, not stepped up to a way where, where Tati has been in that number nine spot. And we knew that that was the case because, you know, Hebert, 
again, that injury that he had a couple of years ago has really killed his his call. And and, and also that season that he, he basically was snake bitten for the entire year has just kind of killed his call because he has never just rediscovered that good form that he had when he came into the league with NYCFC. Uh, but I also thought that this game was kind of wide open. I mean, there was some end-to-end -end action at times. Uh, Noel Buck then drills a shot that goes straight to Johnson. But then in the 33rd minute, the youngster would get, get on the score sheet for the first time as he scored here from Masiel to give the refs a 1-0, or not a 1-0, but a 2-0 lead there. And I know it's still early day, but Noel Buck has definitely show, shows some, some good quality for this refs team and has kind of opened some eye eyeballs to some people that you know this is a kid that i'm pretty sure a couple of weeks ago nobody would know who he is but he's been putting some good shift for the refs ever since he's now started to get some some minutes and that if he can continue this form who knows maybe he could be on on the u.s men's national team team radar or at the very least he could at least be on the u.s youth national team radar too with him being 17 years old right now but uh Bo then ha had a chance to make it free nothing but he hits it straight to Johnson and the refs you know they they seems like they had had the momentum and that they were looking to try to get that third goal uh Buck then tried to make it two here but he he missed wide after he had a free header and I think that was just I mean I, I think he was this is this is an example of of a, a youngster that maybe get a little bit bit too excited after scoring a goal and maybe he was trying to make a second one and yeah he, he just kind of lost his composure a little bit but it, it happens and and you know if he would have gone put that one in oh boy the hype train of Noah Buck would definitely be be the ca case uh in in th this one but we do head to half time with the refs leading two nothing and in the second half oh uh, this is when Georgie Petrovich started to, to step up. I mean, he already stepped up in the first half, but this is where he really made some big impact because he robbed Jason here. And I feel like, like Jason, he clearly should have scored in this. Like, this was a tapped in. I mean, yes, he didn't control it well, but, you know, you got to put that one into the back of the net. And that, again, just sums up sub NYCFC night. They were not clinical whatsoever in, in front of goal. Uh, then Petrovic denied a bear in the near post. And again, NYCFC had started well they were looking to try to get one back but instead the reds pretty much put the final nail in the coffin for nycfc in this game and guess who scored it's tommy mack he scored from jones and farrell to make it free nothing in favor of the Rams. i tell you what i always love to see see when tommy mcnamara gets on on the the score sheet and that yeah he got on the score sheet here he's not, he's all started to become one of my favorite player in the league now with the way of the hard work and also just just sometimes he scores some crazy, crazy goals. And while this was not one of those crazy goals that he scored, he just gets in a good position and puts it in to make it free nothing in favor of the refs. Although uh, Pereira did try to get one back for NYCFC, but he hits it wide from close range. And again, NYCFC, they had the chances. But being wasteful in front of goal and Petrovic continued to show his strong form is the reason why we're at free, free nothing. In fact, uh, Petrovic will make an make one last good save in the 88th minute as he tipped Magno shot over and yeah in the end the refs with a big free nothing win and knowing the fact fact that you know they know FC Cincinnati got a big big win uh just just a day ago they knew that they had to get free points and they did exactly that as the shots in this one and once CFC actually outshots New England 17 to 8 and they actually had more shots on goal seven shots on goal for the six that the refs had six shots off target for the one that New England has one shot that was blocked for the four that NYCFC had and possession wise 36% possession compared to the 64% possession that NYCFC had. But like I said, you know, this is a classic example of what happened when you don't take your opportunity and the opposition does, you end up on the losing end. And right now, NYCFC is just in a, in a free fall right now. Like, again, this is a team that I think if there is one team that you can, can guarantee that they might, might suffer a first round exit. It's got to be NYCFC because this this team just does not look like a, a team that that is the same as we saw saw uh, before Tati Castiano left, and it's just getting to a, a point where if they don't pick it up, they're they're basically a sinking ship right now. And that I'm pretty sure a lot of teams, especially a lot of teams that don't have home field advantage, could want to play against NYCFC because they know that that they get a chance to to face against a relatively cold NYCFC team and maybe get a chance to move on into the next round. But that being said, uh, moving on into the last game on this board is Seattle versus Houston. Now, I'm not going to lie. 
this was probably the weirdest, the craziest, but also maybe the best kind of game for for a Sounders fans after watching this one. And and it's crazy to say that because you know that's kind of just sums up this game because you know this was a game where the Sounders it was a must win game and for a while it looked like it was bleak. It looked like they they were going to have their playoff hopes sealed, and then something happened. Something that we've been waiting five years for, for it to happen and something that I'm pretty sure every Sounders fan, even every MLS fans, are hoping that the day would come that this, this incredible event would happen. And it did. Now, uh, in the first half, uh, Ladero would drag said wide from, from long range before Rusnak would miss hide on the free kick. Then Clark would deny Rui Diaz from close range, and I thought it was a good start for the Sounders. I mean, it was very important. For them to get off to a good start because you know that they are in desperation mode they need to get get three points knowing uh other resort didn't really help them and that they need to to keep pace uh but instead of that they actually can see in the 26th minute as daniel steris would score here to give the dynamo a one nothing lead completely against the run of play because the sounders were the better team and that was really the first shot on goal for the dynamo and to make matters worse that came off of a deflection. And that pretty much just sums up the Sounders' luck. I mean, ever since they won CCL, this team has had no luck in terms of injuries and also calls that have gone against them. I mean, it's almost like like the, the soccer guards are basically demanding heavy payment for, for the Sounders after that CCL win. I mean, yes, they, of course, did something that no MLS team has done, but now it's time to pay up in ter terms of, of the, the league form and the luck that they have. And again, they, they just have so much bad luck throughout the season i mean that's not an excuse in terms of the fact that this sounders team has been one of the worst sounders team i've see seen in, in recent memories but they've, they've also suffered a lot a lot of bad bad luck and this was just an example of it uh then there was a shout for a penalty that was not given for the sounders because of course that's kind of just the way it is for them this season before rude diaz puts it wide from close range in the first 41st minute and we had to have time with the dynamo leading one nothing and we were just one half away if the Sounders weren't able to come back, yeah, it looked like their 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 playoff hope is all but 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 sealed. But in the second half, uh, Rusnak would fire it wide from long range, and again, you know, you would say, think that there should be some urgency shown by by the Sounders t team because you know this was a big forty five minute and could be the forty five minute that determined their season, but there wasn't there. It was a flat start for for this team. It looked like the Sounders were were running out out of ideas of how to go for it on the attack and then it happened in the 59th minute knew who finally scored a goal five years in the the making he has finally puts it in into the back of the net and not only the fact that lumen feel erupted there but i'm pretty sure the mls world erupted there and you know i know this season it's been a season where we have seen players that have finally got their fir first career mls go after a while and probably one of the more, more famous example of that and one that maybe isn't get, getting a lot of attention remember when when johan kapahov scored his first goal and it's like six years year that he's been in the league and he's been one of those players that's on the list of players that's been in mls but for a long time but have never scored a goal and he finally not get that that one and that i just in my mind i'm feeling well if he can can finally create that moment then the impossible could happen. Knew who can finally get 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 on the score sheet, and yeah, he finally did. It, it finally ha has has happened. It's been five years in in the making, though. At the same time, you may be also want to to thank Teenage Hadabi for this because yeah, he basically gave this one right to knew who on a poster their their stamp, and you know knew who that was the moment for him. He know he knew that that was the moment where he, he finally had a chance. To bury that one, one into the back and then and he does and that ties the game up at one apiece and as soon as when that goal went in i knew the sounders were going to win this because that is exactly what they need like this team was dead before this goal was this team looked like they were de dead and buried this team looked like they 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 were were going to to be facing elimination in the matter of days but this goal completely sparked the team and the, the sounders immediately found that energy to try to get that second goal uh, Rudy Diaz then blasted high from close range and again the Sounders they're sensing that momentum and we're looking to take the lead and they had a chance to do so as a penalty was given to them after Montero was bought, bought down uh, by or actually I don't know why I wrote bar, bar low, low there in, in this again, again it's getting late in, in the night and I'm sorry to getting a, a little bit tired I mean Barlow does not play for, for, for the Houston Dynamo in fact I actually forgot who 
was the player that that uh, Montero, of course, won the the penalty on. But either way, it's a penalty for the Sounders, and this was the moment for the Sounders to to score. And you would think they should score because it's Nico Ladero. I mean, Nico Ladero is almost guaranteed from the spot, but Clark denied him. And you know, again, that continues the the narrative of this week of how how we've seen a lot of penalty kick miss. But even then, you know, with that that miss penalty, I still feel feel like. You know the Sounders are going to do it. Like there's no way the Sounders are going to let a game where they saw something five years in the making to 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 end up in a draw. And it turns out that was not the case because just one minute later after the missed penalty, Montero would puts it in. And guess who got got on the assist chart? New Hutolo of all all player got on this on the assist chart from Ladero. And I said this before. Talk about you know I know no uh, Hani Mukta most likely could get get the 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 nod of winning player of the week but why not just give it to to new who like between new who and slolina which is going to be very very close in terms of if you don't don't want to like vote for honey mukta to winning player of the week but yeah that is it's just incredible the fact that 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 that's something that that we thought it would never happen like we thought we would never see the day where new who would score a goal and he finally did it in in, in this play and also getting on on the assist chart too I think that automatically guarantee himself of Player of the Week. And again, I really hope that, that it will happen. It probably won't, but in my mind, I think everybody will know that whoever wins the Player of the Week, everybody's are going to say, yeah, knew who got robbed in, in terms of it. And maybe even some small section will say slowly that also got robbed because of the, the performance he had against against the, the the Columbus crew. But yeah, in the end, the Sounders with a, a, a much-needed 2-1 win and a win to... To stay alive in terms of their playoff chances. I mean, yes, they, they didn't really make up a lot ground because against teams around them were able were able to get big wins, but at least they keep pace, and that's what's an, in, important. Uh, shots in this one: twenty shots compared to four that Houston has, four sh- shots on goal compared to three that the Dynamo has, eight shots off target compared to the one that the Dynamo has, eight shots that was blocked compared to none that the Dynamo has, and possession wise, sixty three percent possession compared to thirty seven percent possession. That the Houston Dynamo has, and also I would like to say say that you know after talking about this game, and I'm gonna repeat what I've always said about the Seattle Sounders, you simply can't count this team out. Like this team, I will still refuse to believe this team will miss the playoffs until when when it's mathematically going to happen. Because you know this is the Seattle freaking Sounders. This team will always find a way to to get to the promised land. Now, obviously, when they do get to the playoffs, I don't think they're gonna go very far. But hey. You know they're gonna try every way to do do so, and again, I, I think as long as as if you know if they can get that late playoff off push, which could happen because this could be the the spark to do so. Yeah, uh, I think they they still have a shot in terms of making the playoffs. But that being said, I am now going to switch board and look at the last two games to finish off uh, match week number twenty nine and this mega review that I ju- I am doing right now. So finally, we are now in the final board, and this review is almost over. Hopefully, I can finish this in less than 15 minutes. But uh, I talked about earlier of how one Cascadia team looked like they stay alive in terms of their fringe playoff hole. Well, that cannot be said about another Cascadia team that is the Vancouver Whitecaps, who I also mentioned they need to, to get, a, get a win in this one. And it's pretty much almost getting to must-win territory if they want to keep alive their playoff hole. Well... They did not get a win. Uh, the Quakes were able to get a 2 nothing win in this one. And it didn't help for the Whitecaps in this one to go down early in this game. Because they did exactly that in the fourth minute. When Jeremy Obobese would score from Jackson Yeo and K. Cow, And that was just a beautiful team goal. And this is the thing about the Quakes. You know, as bad as this season has gone gone for them. And as much as I, I, I've talked about the defense being, being one of the biggest culprits. And also not to mention the front office decided to let Almeida ruin this this team to a point where it was no coming back back in terms of them making the, the playoffs. They've done well on the attacking end. And that, that the attack, I think, think after looking how they, they played this season, there's definitely some promise and some, some foundation heading into next year. And this is a good example of it. What a lovely, lovely team, team goal that is for the Quakes. And yeah, that gives them a one nothing lead. It was a dream start for for the Quakes, but just the last thing that the Whitecaps need. Like when you're in a must-win situation, especially you're on the road, 
The last thing you want is to give up a goal that early in the game and find yourself behind the eight ball. In fact, uh, the Quakes had a couple more chances. Well, they had one other chances in the ninth minute when Jackson Yu puts it what in the back post. This was probably the best game that Jackson Yu has had for, in a long time because you know this, it's not been a great season for 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 him. And that you know, even though I will say that he is still you know, considered one of my favorite players, and it's kind of sad to see see his regression uh, this season and also. In the previous one, though. That being said, in the 18th minute, our uh, goal did hit it one straight to Mark Sinkowski before Veselinovich actually hits one straight to Mark Sinkowski. And also, let me just fix um, Ryan Goal's name. I actually got the D here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, but yeah, uh, the Whitecaps. I thought they started to kind of get back into this game, and I thought the Quakes kind of lost that sharpness. Like in the first 10 minutes, they were all over the the Whitecaps, but you know, the Whitecaps kind of got back into the this game and it looked like they might have a chance to get themselves the equalizer and then the Quakes score that second goal. Uh, it's Montero scoring from Espinoza to make it 2 nothing in favor of the Quakes and you know that old cliche goals can definitely change game. Uh, it couldn't be, be more more true in terms of how this first half went because every time when the Quakes looks like they need to regain momentum and they got got the goal that is exactly how, how they were able to regain momentum because the momentum was back to the Quakes after getting that 2 nothing lead. Hassel uh, denying Cal from close close range before again the Quakes I thought they regained their sharpness on the attack and the momentum and then Tommy Thompson puts it just wide from close in the 43rd minute and we had to have time with the Quakes leading two nothing in this one now in the second half uh Brian White oh boy he I think that this one one he's going to definitely want this one back because he missed White despite being wide open from 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 the 12 yard box and with the quality that Brian White had has shown before for the Whitecaps, you would think he buries that one in. Then go curls it just wide in the 61st minute as, again, the Whitecaps, I thought they started the second half the better side and all the Quakes, they, they were already starting to bunker. And I'm kind of concerned the fact that they started to, to, to bunker very early into this because most of the time when they try to bunker, it doesn't work out because these this defense can't, can't re really hold on hold on to well not only not, not able to hold on to a lead but are are just just goes into free fall, fall mode and always find a way to concede a goal uh mark sinkowski would then deny Gresso after he didn't punch it well i mean another example besides the fact that it's a bad back line but also you know the the inconsistency of jt mark, mark sinkowski could maybe be the downfall for the quakes and it looked like the Whitecaps did get that that goal back in the 70th minute when kevin lee puts it into the back net but the problem is it was it was disallowed for offside. I think it was Kevin Lee, the one that was offside. It was very close, but I think they they got the the call right in the end. But I thought the game kind of opened up, and this does not bow well for the Quakes because this is exactly what the Whitecaps want. They like to play a game that is is open and like to play on the transition, and you know, and just in general, when you're leading a game and you're trying to close out a game, trying to play an open game is not the way to try to clo close out a a game. But Godinho then hits one straight to Marcinkowski in the 75th minute. And as the time winds down, the Quakes continue to be in that bunker shape. They were looking to try to seize out a 2-0 win. But the good news is, I think they've done a much better job in the final 10 minutes. Like, while things were definitely not looking so so good uh, for part of the second half, I think they started to do a good job in turn, terms of seizing out this game. And also a combination, I think the Whitecaps kind of lost their their belief like again they had some good chances in this one to get themselves back into to this game but they were not able to get that 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 goal to set up a grandstand finish and that belief was kind of lost in the last 10 minutes but yeah in the end the quakes will be two nothing win over the whitecaps and by the way it's a clean sheet for the quakes i think this is only the second clean sheet that the quakes had had all season long like again getting a clean sheet for the quakes is like a mir miracle and and it's it's definitely was kind of the, the case with, with there's been many times in this game that they, they look like they almost get, gave up a goal and that they probably would have gave up a goal if, if the flag didn't save them in the 70th minute. But the shots in this one, 15 shots for the 9 that the Quakes had, 5 shots on goal for the 6 that the Whitecaps had, 4 shots off target for the 3 that the Quakes had, 5 shots on block for the 1 that the Quakes had, and possession-wise, 52% possession compared to 48% possession that the Quakes has in this game. And like I said, you know, there there's some positive that I can, I can say. I can come out of this, even though I know this has been a very disappointing quick season and a season that has kind of, kind of what I thought it was going to happen, which just looks like it was a fro 
throwaway year, but there's some promise. There's some good fa- foundation, and as long as they can can maybe be short of that defense. I mean, they kind of have tr- tried to do so with some summer signing. I mean, bring that guy called Rodriguez from Brazil. He, he, he uh, by the way, I think made a debut in this game. He actually looked looked de- decent, but you know they can get more defensive reinforcement. This could be a good team. This this could be be a team that could be a playoff team uh, as soon as next season, but. I can't say the same about the Vancouver Whitecaps because yeah, this has not been been a great run. It's been 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 a horrible run of form that they they've been in, and it's been been, been the reason why it kind of has killed their their playoff ch- chances. But that being said, uh, moving on into to the last game, and yes, we're finally in the last game on the sport after talk, doing this mega review is LAFC versus RSL, and this actually wasn't as close. As the scoreline suggested, I mean, this could have easily been four, five, or even six, six nothing. Well, actually, I think that that's a little bit unfair because I thought RSL had some chances in this one too. But there was no doubt that this game was kind of similar to the one one that when LAFC played against RSL not long ago, where you know, again, LAFC they just have RSL number, and the only reason why this game wasn't as big of a blowout is because LAFC was kind of struggling in term, terms of their finishing. But the good news is, at least this this time, it did not come back to bite them like they did against the Dynamo. In fact, they had an early chance in the ninth minute when Chiellini heads it wide from close range. Though Savarino did have a one-hopper that goes right to Crapo before Bononi, uh, Bononi got, got uh, missed wide from, from close range. I'm, I'm still trying to get the, the correct pr- pronunciation. I mean, it doesn't sound like like it, it's, it's a hard... Pr- pronunciation but i kind of always just kind of screw, screwed it up though no you know of course he made his debut in this one and i thought he, he had a good game i mean you know it, it would be nice if he would have got on the score sheet but there was times where there's a reason why why uh lafc decided to 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 bring him him in and bring him as a dp player because he definitely ha- ha- has that that lethal finish in in his game or well not just lethal finishing but also just creating some dangerous chance is too. Uh, though uh, in the 27th minute, McMahon did have to push a dangerous cross away that LAFC was was putting in. But I thought LAFC, this looks like it was it was usual form for them. Because, you know, this team, we know that they're going to get off to a slow start. But they will kick into the gear as the half goes long. And boy, did they kick into gear. Uh, Moreno would then head one straight to, to McMahon before uh, Opoku would curl it just wide. And again, you know, despite the fact that they did kind of kick into gear, Poor finishing was, was once again a problem for LAFC. And this was a problem, as I said, with the last game. Looks like it kind of continued into this one. Though that looked like it was quickly erased because in the 33rd minute, Arango puts it into the back net. The problem is, he was in an offside position, so the goal did not count. And then Hollins had had a shot that was clear off the line in the 37th minute. And I bet a lot of LAFC fans will feel like, uh-oh, is this like Houston again? Are they snake bit in front of goal again? Fortunately, that was not the case because as we head to the second half with the game scoreless, LAFC finally break through. And who else but Ryan Hollinshead gets the goal again. Hollinshead, he's been kind of an unsung hero. He's been a guy that I know there's been a lot of great performers in this LAFC team. But Hollinshead might not be be a player that might might be a, a known commodity to know that he's been having a great season for, for LAFC. And that, again, it would be very interesting to see whether or not if LAFC do do re- re-sign him because you know if they, they don't do it then i'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of suitor to to trying to get ryan Hollinshead, who is always considered to be one of the most under the rate are are kind of guy that that has been been performed very well in this league uh then opoku actually went through through on goal but unfortunately he kind of got got caught into two minds he didn't know should he just maybe play it back or or just chipped it over McMahon, and instead he kind of ch- chipped a weak shot right, uh, right to McMahon, and you know Mahana Opoku would want to have that that one back. Like most of the time when Opoku go through go on that like that, you know he's a very clinical co finisher, and he has had a breakout year, but not that time in that situation. But in the 56th minute, uh, Crepo did deny Severin, you know, as I thought that was kind of the best chance for RSL. Like RSL was just getting absolutely plummeted up to that point 
Uh, and I also thought that LAC got to be careful because, you know, it's only one nothing. And we know this RSL team is a resilient bunch. They will always find ways to fight and crawl their, their way back into the game. Uh, but Vela did blast it hard from close range before Ruby puts it wide from, from close from, from the other end. McMath then denied Arango, but Barunga uh, had a second crack of it, but he blasted that, that one wide. And the shots were now 14-5 to in favor of LAFC. But again... It's only one nothing, and will these missed chances come back to haunt, haunt LAFC? Good news is it won't, because in the 68th minute, uh, Chicho Arango would score from Vela to make it two nothing in favor of LAFC. Because of course Chicho Arango has to get on the score sheet. It's been it's pretty much a given that he has to be on his score sheet. It's not an LAFC game if Arango doesn't put one into the back of the net. Then Bell tried to make it three nothing, but he hits one just wide after getting a free header. Again, you know Gareth Bell still feels like he's a little bit. Bit, bit rusty and you know if if Gareth Bell was in prime form he would bury that one 10 out of 10 time uh but then on the other end Craig Poe had to deny Julio who had a a free header and again RSL they're not going away like yes they, they they've been second best in this game and that most of the time they've been dominated but they had created some some dangerous chances and they were looking to try to get themselves one back but in late in this game, a penalty was given to LAFC after McMath brought down Mendes in the box, um, which Vela had a chance to put the icing on the cake, but McMath said no. Uh, he denied Vela from the spot, though you know it wasn't really a good penalty from Carlos Vela. And by the way, they actually did have to go to VAR to see whether or not Zach McMath did keep his uh, feet uh, on the line, and you know it's very close. And I think Indiana. They did get the, the call right where, you know, again, it has to be clear and obvious. And I feel like from what I saw on the replay of that, it wasn't really clear and obvious. So, therefore, they, they said that that, that uh, save from McMath was deemed legal. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, or But but in the end, it really do doesn't matter because LAFC does walk away with a 2 nothing win, a much-needed win after they've been going through this, this mini slump in September. And the shots in this one, 20 shots. Compared to 8 that RSL had. 7 shots on goal compared to 5 that RSL had. 10 shots off target compared to 6 that RSL had. Both teams had 3 shots that was blocked. And possession wise 55% possession. Compared to 45% possession that RSL has in this game. And again you know this looks very similar to 2019. Because uh, in or not 2019 I'm sorry. Or yeah yeah in 2019. I forgot they won the supporter shield that season. Again it's late right now. I'm starting to get tired after doing this make it review. But. You know, for, for LAFC, it started kind of look like 2019 again, where, you know, they kind of hit a little bit of a cold stretch doing uh, the latter part of the season, but they definitely picked up in a way where they won the supporter shield and eventually did go on a relatively deep playoff run until they suffer a, 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 a defeat against the Seattle Sounders. And they're just hoping that that's not going to be the case. This time they can actually go, go all the way. And, you know, just looking at the Western Conference right now, I mean, again, I still don't think there's a lot of team that can 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 be be beat the the might of LAFC. I still think they're they're the favorites. I mean, maybe right now when you look at at how the the standing is, maybe the only team you you could say Austin because Austin have beat beat LAFC, but Austin hasn't been in good form. Maybe Nashville can do it because Nashville does have a difference maker in Honey Mukhtar. It seems like they're hitting the right for, form, but you know, besides that, I don't think there's a lot of team that can can beat the might of LAFC right now and that you could maybe even say that it's getting to a point maybe this is LAFC to, to lose in the Western Conference and that's unfortunately, unfortunately a bad thing to say about LAFC because that they've always fought find ways in those big games to not not get it done and you know we'll see whether or not if if they can do so because like I said I you know LAFC fans will enjoy this win but they know that that they're, they're clearly a team that is in playoff mode like once playoff begin that's when the business, of course, course happened, and it's going to be interesting to see what how they do this season in the playoffs, and can they finally end that narrative of them choking in big games. But there you have it. We've made it to the end of this mega review. Uh, I don't know how long this review actually ended up because I still have to, to put it in bunch uh, after I, I did like four different clips of this after doing four different games. But either way, if you guys enjoyed this review, make sure you guys leave a like and smash the subscribe button. And again, I know that this has been a long review, but that's why there's timestamps down in the description where you you know you don't have to watch this whole, whole review. If you want me to talk about your, your team and how, 
how, how they perform in, in the game that you play this weekend, there's always that timestamp to basically get to that. But yeah, either way, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you guys leave a like, smash the subscribe button, and yeah, I of course will see you guys next time.